Hi everybody and welcome to a tutorial showing the geometry editing functions within ProBuilder version 2.5. As always, make sure you're watching the latest video. Go ahead and check at Procore3D.com slash ProBuilder. So let's jump right in. Uh, assuming everyone has already watched and installed uh, or watched the install videos and installed ProBuilder properly, make sure you have no errors in your console, of course, and that you've already also watched the GUI overview video. So we're not going to go into details on this. We're going to assume you've already seen that and you know what's going on there. So we'll start with the basics. That would be creating simple objects. Number one, just hit Control K on your keyboard. That will bring in the standard ProBuilder cube. You can also use, I'll delete this, Control Shift K to bring up the shape menu. This will allow you to create many different types of shapes. For instance, obviously the cube is the basic. We can choose a stair type. can choose a cylinder and many other items within here. So this is great to look at. We won't go through all the settings on this of course, but as you'll see depending on the type you choose, you'll get a few different parameters. The pipe has radius, height, thickness, number of sides and segments, and you can change these to create the item that you need. While the object is blue, this means it's in preview mode. You can turn this off by turning off the show preview checkbox and you can click center preview in case you've moved your camera, scene camera, and you'd like to center it. Once you have the shape that you'd like to build with, click on the build button in green at the bottom. You'll notice it no longer has the blue highlight and it is ready to edit. So let's close the shape menu and we can edit this object. First of all, it's important to note that a ProBuilder object is basically the same as any other object in Unity. You can move it around, you can rotate it in any way, and you can even scale it. Though we generally don't recommend scaling, not because it does anything bad, but because you're better off using the built-in tools to edit the object instead of scaling. This is for various uh, performance and efficiency reasons in Unity, and also just because it, uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of using ProBuilder if you're using the scale. So let's bring that back to just a non-rotated and scaled object. We can use the transform controls, like anything else as well, to set this directly to the zero, or to the world center or origin. And let's begin editing this object. Right now, it is in object mode, or ProBuilder is in object mode. You can tell that from the mode panel at the top, where we have object, vertex, edge, and face modes. We'll start by looking at face since it's usually the easiest to work with. In face mode, you can click on any face to select it. You can hold shift to select multiple faces, and you can drag select to pick many faces at once. This is a good place to mention the select hidden toggle. Right now, you can see that is set to do not select hidden. I can toggle this onto on mode, and now I can select hidden items. So if I drag select, my selection will go through visible and select on the back sides. If I turn that off and drag select, you'll notice it does not select through elements. This can be useful especially if you are in vertex mode and you just want to select a few that you can see, but you don't want ProBuilder to accidentally select all the way through and end up creating some really bad stuff. But many times you do want that, for example, if you just want to select everything along the top here. So keep that in mind, the select hidden on or off toggle. This is also a good time to mention that all of the rules I'm talking about in face mode apply the same to vertex and edge when selecting. You can click on a single vertex or edge, hold shift to select others, or drag select. The same goes for edges. Click to select, and hold shift to select multiple, and drag to select. No difference. In both edge and vertex mode, you can also click directly on the face to select all the elements for that face. So in edge mode, it will select all the edges on that face, and again, I can hold shift to select them. And the same goes for vertex. I can click directly on the face and select all the vertices from that face. Just a few more selection tips and then I promise we'll move on to the more interesting work of actually editing. Once again, let's move back to face mode 
and we have quite a few really nice selection tools. Number one is the Grow Selection option. So if I click on Grow Selection, by default it's going to just grow outward. You can also hold Alt and click on it. Notice that it has that plus symbol. And you get the Grow Selection options. So one of the best options here is Restrict to Angle. And below that you have the max angle that it will uh, grow out within. Let's, uh, better than explaining, let's try that. So click on any face, and then click on Grow Selection. Since the max angle right now is set to 42, you can see it selects all those angles along, all those faces along the top. If I select a side face and click Grow Selection, it's going to select all of those along the side. This is really handy for quickly selecting large areas that are very similar to each other in angle. As we mentioned in the GUI tutorial, which you should already know, uh, whatever you set here becomes the default. So just keep that in mind. Once you've set that, this tool will continue to work as you have set until you change the settings again. Below the Grow Selection is the Shrink Selection. So if I have these selected and shrink it, in this case, because I have the By Angle set, it's going to shrink it down to nothing. So let's actually turn that off. I'll turn off the Restrict Angle. And once again, grow the selection. And I can shrink the selection inward with the Shrink Selection. I can use the Invert to select everything else. There's just one more selection item to look at, and then we'll move on to the editing. For this example, I'm going to move back to object mode, and I'm going to rotate this cube to just some crazy angle, or not cube, pipe. Now, if I select one of these faces, you'll notice that the handle is pointing in the global direction, or global coordinates, which, as you can see, matches up here the, uh, the view gizmo. Z is pointing forward, Y is up, and X is to the right. So these are global coordinates. And this is generally the most useful option, but many times you'll want some other options. So here we have a toggle for the handle coordinates. So you click on this, right now it is in global mode, I can change it to local. Now you'll see that the handles are aligned to the object. So no matter which face I click on, and the same will be for edge and vertex, the handle will be aligned to the object. So this is why I rotated that uh, this pipe to such a strange degree. You can see that the handle is aligning to it. Lastly, we have the face alignment, or the plane. So now it's going to align directly to the plane itself. So depending on what I click on, you can see the Z always points outward from that face. So this is really handy if you want to move something directly out along its own uh, normal direction and not on the local or global directions. All right, let's change this back to the standard global alignment and start doing some editing. I'll move back to the geometry editing mode and I'm going to delete this object and create just a standard cube, Control K. I'll also set this back to the world origin just because I'm picky. Okay, so we're finally ready to do some editing on this object. I'll start by doing a quick rundown of all the tools available for element editing, and then we'll actually build something to show how they work. So we'll start in the vertex mode by clicking on the vertex mode icon in the top here. And then I'll just select a few vertices so that we have all the options. You notice, first of all, at the top, we have three face options. And these are going to be available at all times, actually, since they are face options that you can use even in the edge and vertex mode. So we'll ignore those for now, and we'll move on to the pure vertex editing options. I'll just do a drag select so that those become grayed out. The face is not selected anymore. So with these vertices selected, I have a few options here. First, I have the collapse vertices, which is going to collapse them down to a single point. I have the weld vertices, which won't work in this case, but it would basically be used to bring verts together that are just a small distance apart and weld them down into one, generally used if you are bringing two edges together. Below that, I have the connect, 
So if I select these two vertices, I can connect them. And at the very bottom, I have the split vertices. So in this case, if I select, say, this vert here on the bottom, and I click on split, you won't see a difference right away, but what it's done is split that into its three separate verts. So there's now one here, one here, and one here. This is a good time to showcase the weld functionality. I can select these three. If I click or hold Alt and click on that, on the weld button, let's set the weld distance to something, well, 0.25 will work just fine, and then click weld. As you can see, those have all been welded together. So again, that weld is very similar to collapse, except that it will only collapse vertices together that are within that range, which you can select by holding Alt, clicking on it, and setting the range. Generally, I tend to keep this at actually a very low number, something like 0.01, and I'm only going to use it when I have edges that I need to bring together or verts that have been split and I need to weld them back together, and I'm using collapse most often for large items or I just want to, as it sounds, splat them right together completely. Let's move on to the edge functions. So I'll click on the edge icon. And now the toolbar buttons have changed. Once again, if I select any faces by clicking on them, those top three will light up, but I'm not going to use those just yet. So let's just do a drag select to pick a few edges, and we'll look at the options. The first edge editing option, the bridge is actually grayed out right now. This is because we need two edges that don't have a face between them. Let's go ahead and delete a face by clicking on it to select, and hit backspace to delete it. And now we can bridge these two edges. We can do this because there is a gap between them. So this is generally a healing technique uh, for bringing two edges back together or putting a face there. So with those selected, I click on bridge. And just as it sounds, it bridges between those two edges. Below bridge, we have the connect edges button, which again, as it sounds, will simply connect the edges with a new edge. Further below that is the extrude edge. This will also only work if you have an edge that has one empty side. So if we click on that, as you can see, it extrudes it straight outward. Another or simpler way to use this is just to hold shift and move the edge. This is a really quick and handy way to build a lot of detailed geometry very quickly. I'm a big fan of it. I'll just use Control Z and undo that so we have a little less complicated object. Below the extrude edge, we have the insert loop option. So if I click on the insert loop with an edge selected, just like that, it's going to run a loop all the way around as far as it can. To make this more obvious, if I were to break the loop by deleting this face and now I do the same action insert loop that loop will only go as far as it can here this is a good way to quickly add extra geometry as well below insert loop is the insert new vertex option this also has an alt click option if I hold alt and click on it I can choose how many subdivisions I'm going to add. We'll keep it at one, just for the first demonstration. So let's say this vertex, or edge, at the top, I need to add an extra cut in the center or break it into two edges. I can click on Subdivide Edges, and now I have two distinct edges here with a floating vertex in the center. I'll move back to Vertex to show that more clearly. There you can see that new vertice, or vertex, in the center. This is a tool to be careful with because if you end up with a lot of floating vertices, your geometry can quickly get a little bit mangled or strange looking and cause errors. Especially if you are putting in a high number of subdivisions. For example, I will take just any edge and throw in a bunch of subdivisions. You now have a lot of edges in there with a lot of floating vertices. 
all of these here. Oops, all of these. So just something to note, it's very useful, but it can also cause trouble if you're not being careful and remembering you have these floating verts. Obviously, if you start moving them around, you're going to get some really strange geometry that could cause problems in the future. So let's undo that. Lastly, let's move on to the actual face functions. So I'll click on the face tools, or the face mode icon, and now we can use the face tools. The very first tool, of course, is just delete. So I can easily delete a face or multiple faces with that. Usually, it's probably best just to use the backspace key on your keyboard, probably the easiest shortcut key to remember. Just know that if you hit delete, you're going to delete the entire object. So be careful of that one. Luckily, Control z works great. Below the delete faces is one that is sometimes a little confused. This is the detach. So what this will do is allow you to not delete the face, but to detach them to a separate object or element. So if I click on detach, I can choose submesh, and this will make it into a new submesh. So I can move that around separate from the others. On the other hand, if I choose detach to new object, it becomes an entirely separate object. So let's move back into object mode to demonstrate this. Now this object and this object are separate. You can also merge these back into a single object by selecting both of them and clicking on merge. We'll look at these object tools a little later. Moving back to the face editing mode, Below the detach is the extrude function. This is probably the function that everyone is going to use most while they're using Unity. So number one, you can just hold shift and extrude. So you can just move. You can also rotate while extruding. You'll create somewhat strange geometry if you do that, but it's still very handy. And also very useful you can scale while extruding and this will do essentially an inset. And that's all done just by holding shift and using the basic transform controls. Move, rotate, and scale. You can also use the button in the toolbar. When you click on it, it will perform the default extrude action. If you alt click on it, you can change that default. So you get the option for as group and the distance that it will extrude. As group will make sure that when you extrude, they move outward together like this. If I turn that feature off and I have multiple faces selected, they will extrude separately, just like that. Let's go ahead and delete the crazy object we've created here and create something new. So back to a standard cube and back into face editing mode. Below the extrude is the conform normals. So this won't make much sense until we have some flipped normals. So we're going to skip ahead a little bit to the flip normals. So with a couple faces selected, I'm going to click on this flip face normals button. And right away, it'll kind of look like I've deleted those faces. But what's actually happened is they are flipped. So now I can see them from the inside, but not the outside. What this is probably most useful for is creating interior spaces from otherwise exterior objects. For example, if I undo that, if I double click to select all the faces and then invert them, I now have an interior space. And I can do the same to make it an exterior object. Again, something to probably play around with, use until you are more familiar with it, if it's not making sense right away, or if you don't see a use for it. So going back to the conform normals, let's say I had flipped a couple faces, maybe by accident. So now I'm pretty confused what's going on with this cube. I can double click to select all the faces on the object, and then click on conform normals. And it's just going to choose whatever the most common normal is and flip the faces so that they conform to that. 
just handy to have if you've noticed that you've accidentally flipped a few normals or you want to make sure they're all facing the same direction. Below the flip normals is the flip triangle. So let's move into the wireframe mode so we can see this a bit better. So with a wireframe shown, you can see that, as most of you will probably know, there's no such thing really as a quad for geometry. Everything is actually triangles. Or it's not that there's no such thing, but, uh, well, they're triangles. Um, so if we're moving some of these vertices, I'll go back to shaded mode. As I move it, you can kind of see how that try is changing the look of this face. And you might want it to look the opposite way. For example, if I were to directly set that connection, maybe you want it to look like that instead. So instead of setting an edge directly through there, you can simply flip the try. So select the face and click on flip, and it will flip the direction of that try. If I move back to wireframe mode, you can see this more clearly. So as I'm flipping it, the tries are being set or flipped between directions. The last two buttons move back to shaded mode. And I'm going to undo these edits. So we have a simple cube again. Okay. So the last two options, number one, we have the merge faces. This is useful if you have some items. I'm just going to create a little extra geometry here that you'd like to make into one single face. For example, these three, I could probably turn into one and it would look nicely smoothed across. So I'll select those faces and click on Merge Faces. Now, this will be treated as one single face, even though it does still have, again, if we move to wireframe, extra edges through there. The final face editing tool is the subdivide faces tool. So let's select these two faces and click on subdivide. Now each of these faces has been subdivided into four new faces, which I can use to add more geometry or detail to the object. Lastly, let's take a look at the geometry editing tools that will affect the entire object. So move back to geometry editing mode and create just a standard cube to work with again. So once again, the green items are all of the geometry editing tools that will apply to the entire object up here. The first geometry editing tool for the object is the merge objects. So if I have two, I'll just control D to duplicate this one. If I have two objects and I'd like to merge them down into one, I can click on Merge, and I get this option to Merge Delete or Merge Save. If I choose Merge Delete, the original objects will be deleted. If I choose Merge Save, which I'll do just for demonstration, you'll see that the original objects are kept, but they are disabled in the scene. So if I were to move this new one away, and now I can turn these back on. So they're kept just in case you'd like to go back to a non-merge state. Let's just delete those and keep our merged object here. Below the Merge Objects tool is the Flip Normals. This will quickly flip all the normals on the entire object. Again, very useful for creating an interior space. For example, if I had created, let's quickly build up what might become sort of a hallway or some sort of interior structure. Let's say I have this and I'd like to turn it into an interior space. All I need to do is click on flip normals and now I could run around inside of here with a character. The collision and everything is set up automatically. And I can flip it back out with the flip normals. Below flip normals is the subdivide object so this, just like in the element editing modes, will subdivide the faces, except this in object mode will subdivide all at once. So instantly, I've added quite a bit more detail. And I can even do that again to add even more detail. 
And though, of course, this is going to start slowing down Unity if you go too far. Click it one more time. We have quite a bit of detail there. And so forth. Let's undo those just to have a simpler object. Next is the reset transform or freeze transform some of you may know it as this will reset the transform all the way back to zero 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 rotation zero and scale one 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 below reset pivot is the conform normals tool so this just like in element mode as well if I have a few flipped normals I'll just flip these for demonstration if I have a few but they're not all facing the same direction I can select the object and click on the conform normals and it will choose the most common normal direction and apply that to all the faces. A special tool that's new in version 2.5 is the triangulate faces. So if I use this on our object here you won't really see much difference since it's just a flat or hard surface object. Let's create something new to see how this works in more detail. So I'm going to hit Control shift k and choose a plane and I'll keep these basic settings for now and click build. Now if I move a few of these faces around and create something like a terrain something a bit more organic you can see how right now this is working on quads which is alright for most hard surface modeling, but when you want to make something organic or give it a neat sort of uh, poly look, then you can use the triangulate faces tool. So if I click this with the object selected in object mode, you can see how it instantly turns everything into these neat looking polys, which is very similar to the really neat pack called Polyworld you might have seen on the asset store made by Quantum Theory. So now I can go in and further edit this if I'd like and create a pretty neat looking object. This is also a perfect chance to demonstrate the smoothing tool which also applies in a way to both objects and faces. So let's click on the smoothing tool over here in the panel and we'll open up this new panel. So the way smoothing works is by setting groups similar to 3D Studio Max if you're used to that. Any face that it has the same group will be smoothed into the other so that they don't have this faceted look. For example, if I drag select a group of faces here and set their smoothing group to 1, notice how they now all smooth into one group, but they do not smooth into others. I can also select another group here, maybe all of these, set that to a different group, and I'll select the others and give them yet another group. So now we have these multiple smooth sections which hopefully is showing up fairly well. I can also select all these faces, clear their smoothing groups to bring back that faceted look if that's what I'd like, or set them all to one single smoothing group. Which is a great way to take a fairly low poly object and make it look or appear more high poly than it is since they'll smooth together and not have those sharp edges. And for the final but possibly one of the most useful tools or geometry editing tools, I'll move back to a standard cube. Once again set this back to 0, 0, 0 just because I like to have it that way. And we have the pivot editing tools. So this allows you to change where this pivot is. First of all, you'll want to check in the Unity settings that you have this set to pivot. So notice if it's on center, the handle is simply in the center of your object, and pivot will set it to the actual pivot point of your object. Just like it sounds, this is where the object pivots around. So you can see it's moving around that point if I rotate it. The same goes for scaling. It's scaling based on that point, or you might call it as from that point. So ProBuilder will let you move that point around, which is very handy if you need to change uh, for a physics-based object, or if you just want to be able to edit and move the object around more easily. The quickest way to do it is to move into geometry mode and select a single vertex, 
let's actually choose a different one up here and click on set pivot. Now if I go back to object mode, this is our new pivot up at this point. So this is very useful, for example, if you've somehow moved your geometry away, but your pivot is left in an odd location. Obviously this isn't much good. I can select any vertex or edge or face and all that will happen is once I have them selected and I click on set pivot, the pivot will be set to the center of my selection. So again that can be a oops, that can be a single vertex. I can set the pivot directly to there or I can set it to, for example, all the vertices or just a group and then it will be set to the center of that selection. So now my pivot is here. In object mode you can also instantly set the pivot directly to the center of the selected object just by hitting Control J. So it's a very quick and easy way to move your pivot to the center if it's gotten far off in some way. Okay, so I lied. There's one more geometry editing tool for the objects, and that is the mirror tool. So for this, let's quickly create a semi-complex object, just to demonstrate how it would work. We need something that has a bit more detail. So I'm going to quickly build up just something here. All right, so let's say this is our great and beautiful complex object we spent a whole day working on. And now we want to make a mirrored copy of this. We can't just rotate it with a duplicate because it's going to face the other direction. So that won't do at all. So we can select the object, click on mirror, and now we have the mirror tool options. You can mirror on the X, Y, or Z, or any combination. In this case, I'll mirror it over the X axis, so the red, so I'll choose that and click mirror. And there we go, I have an exact copy that I can use, edit, or merge these two together to have essentially a symmetry. That being a space symmetry, not asymmetry, single word. Bad word choice. So that's it for building and editing geometry, or at least the basics of it, the fundamentals within ProBuilder. As of version 2.5, as always, make sure you're looking at the latest because there might be a lot more added since this video. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in future tutorials where we go over texturing, advanced modeling techniques, and much more.